Welcome, everybody, for, and thank you for joining us again on what is a beautiful Saturday here in the Brookshires at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. It's Sunday, sunny, I should say, and uh, probably in the high 80s. And so here we are on another Saturday morning to uh, welcome you from around the world. And to today is one of my favorite talks that I haven't actually done in about seven years. And so I've greatly updated it, and that is the connection with the Shroud of Turin and the image of divine mercy. It's a fascinating topic, and we are super glad that you could be with us today as uh, we'll have a lot more slides than we normally do, but I'll get through them. We'll move them pretty quick so that we don't have to spend too much time on the talk today keeping you um, too much longer than we normally would. All right. So today, as I mentioned, we have um, an opportunity to look at a relic of our faith. And this relic, if you look at the first slide, comes from our Lord and his crucifixion and his death and resurrection. It encompasses all of that. The passion is there through the wounds. The death is there from his dying with the blood and the water that came out of his heart. And then he resurrected. So when we look at the next slide, we see what traditionally has been our understanding of the crucifixion. You see Jesus there with maybe a loin a loincloth uh, in between two others being crucified. Now, this is probably 99.9% .9 of the images that you see on the crucifixion or what you think about when you see the crucifixion. But let's look at the next image. What is this? What is that on our Lord? Is that a cloth? Is that some kind of garment? Well, we're going to look at this deeper. Now, this one isn't the shroud necessarily. That's not what we're saying here. But there are different understandings of how it would have been at the time of Christ and his crucifixion regarding cloths, burial um, garments, and whatnot. And this is what we're going to talk about today. All right. Now, in this next image, we do know this for sure. We do know that Jesus was removed from the cross and taken to the tomb where he was laid and spices were added. Now, this kind of burial was common in first century Judaism. So we go to the next slide, which is a quote from the gospel passage of John. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, this is very interesting because what we have in it is a document on our next slide from a rabbi in the first century that kind of lists for us what was done. It says spices of myrrh and aloes, aloe, aloes, excuse me, were added. Now this is Jewish burial practices. Smaller cloth was draped over the face. This is gonna be important and we'll talk about this in a minute. And they were buried in caves, usually carved out of limestone. And so look at this next picture. That's actually an example of the type of tomb that we would see in Christ's time, hewn right out of the rock, right out of the image of the ground that Jesus would have walked, and this is where he would have been buried. Now, when we understand the story of what happened at the Christ's resurrection or crucifixion, death, and burial, I want to read you a passage from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 1 through 10. Let us read this. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. 
So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the, whom, the one whom Jesus loved, which we know is John, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter came out with the other disciple and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That's a little bit of humility of John there, right? He doesn't mention his name in humility, but he does say that he beat Peter to the tomb. And stopping to look in, he saw the linen cloths, plural, lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw again the linen cloths, plural, lying and the napkin. This is very interesting. The napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, plural, so now we've got at least three garments, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know that the scripture, that from the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Fascinating. And I want to say a couple things about this. All right. First of all, Peter came with John and John deferred to Peter, let him enter the tomb first. That's a little sidebar, but an important note to show the primacy of Peter here as the one that was the leader. They went in and grave cloths were there, but not disarranged, not all messed up, but lying neatly and folded. This is very important. The grave claws did not look as if they had been taken off. <clears throat> this is interesting because with 75 pounds of spices that they would have put in the shroud, Jesus would have had to have struggled to get out of it. And if he would have had to struggle to get out of the shroud, if he really didn't die, as some people say, and he really was just unconscious, and when he woke up, if he struggled to get out of it, it would have been all a mess. If he did, it would have been torn to shreds, the shroud itself, and the sudarian, which is the Latin word for napkin, which we just read, the napkin, the sudarian would not have been rolled up. Now, here's the thing that I like. If somebody had stolen the body, which is another theory of why Christ disappeared, if somebody stole the body, they would not have left the linen cloths, fine linen, behind. And certainly they wouldn't have folded them. No thief would have taken the time to unwrap the corpse and then fold the cloths. In those days, this is important, robbers stole the linen and left the body because it was the linens that were worth something, not the body. So the robbers would take the linen and leave the body, not the other way around. Here the body was taken, but the linens were left. It was as if the body of Jesus had simply evaporated from underneath these claws. Now, John believed, and it says that he went in and he believed. All right, so this is very interesting. Now, we just talked about some of the burial practices that we saw. And in the next slide, you can see Peter and John racing to the tomb. So that Peter and John racing to the tomb was this beginning of what now we now celebrate as the resurrection and this cloth called the Shroud of Turin. What is it? For those of you who've never heard of it before, it's a relic of this event. It is a, um, an example left behind of God of what happened that day. And so the next slide, we can see the type of tomb that Peter and John would have entered into, as I said earlier. Now, this is probably a, a replica or an example of something very similar. 
to what our Lord would have entered into. But let's go on now and finish talking about these burial practices. All right. The body was washed and anointed with oil. So let's look at the next slide here where it says the practices of the first century, again, from the rabbis. The body was washed and anointed with oil. The hands and the feet were wrapped in linen. All right? And the whole body was wrapped into a single, single cloth. Now, this is important because the shroud is an image of a cloth, but the image from Christ is on only one side. That's because you had the body of Christ and he was laying on one part of the linen cloth and it folded over him, kind of like if I took this piece of paper and Christ's body is laying on one part of the linen cloth, it was folded over and when he resurrected, the image was burned, but it's only on one side of the cloth. This is what is very important. Now, the next slide gives you an example of the different type of body coverings that would have been used by somebody in first century Palestine. The burial cloths of Christ. Now look at that image. There's images over the face. There's the wrapped around, whole body is wrapped in a shroud. There's images of different claws. We have to look at this. There's different body cover, co coverings, if you will, that we read similar to John chapter 20, verse 7. All right, so this is important because two are described in the passage we just read as linen, and the other, as I mentioned, was called a napkin, or as I said in Latin, sudarium. Let's go to the next slide. A cloth has been venerated for centuries in Oviedo, Spain, where it is kept in a reliquary, and that's the image you're looking right there. This, called the Sudarium of Oviedo, is a traditional cloth of Christ that actually was put on his head over his face immediately after the crucifixion. So while he was still on the cross, it is believed that this cloth was placed over his head. It has blood, and it says that it seems as if the Sudarium of Oviedo was first used before the dead body was taken down from the cross. And listen to this, discarded when Jesus was buried. Now that would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? To why it was lying off to the side, rolled up away from the linen. Christ was buried in the linen, but there's this other napkin or sudarium that was laying off to the side. They believe that it was on the face of Christ, on his head, after being taken, or after dying, while he's on the cross, then removed and taken to the tomb, then it was discarded. Now, we have another relic cloth called the Veil of Montepello. And look at this. This is the next image. And I, I know there's different pronunciations of this. Montepello, Manapello, Monopolo. But whatever it is, this image is a different image that I'm gonna tell you about right now. Now, at first, when I saw this image, I thought, wow, it looks too cartoony. I don't believe this image. I really don't. Um, it looks phony, it looks cartoony. But then I saw a connection with this image, and I'm gonna tell you what they think this image was, where it was from in a moment. This image was from a cloth that they believe was put on the outside of the shroud, actually placed on the head on the outside of the shroud of Turin. Now, again, I first thought it was too cartoony, but then 
I saw a match. Look at the next slide. The next slide actually shows another match with the divine mercy image, which is also a match to the Shroud of Turin that we're going to explain the whole rest of this talk. But that veil of Montepello, or as they call it, uh, yes, the veil of Monopolo or Montepello, Mon Monopolo, Pello, is very interesting. Because in this image, many people thought it was the veil of Veronica. You'll still see this online. You'll see that image I just showed you and people will call it from the veil of Veronica. Many thought it was the same thing. Well, go to the next slide. This has traditionally been what is the veil of Veronica and this holy face of Jesus that is on it. Now let's talk about the holy face. The holy face, and first of all, there's some great groups de dedicated to adoring the holy face of Jesus. I know Kathy Walbeck's group up in Buffalo, New York, the holy face ministry that they do up there is a great group of ladies who are devoted to adoring our Lord. They've even had the image appear in hosts there at their chapel. And what's interesting is the holy face image that we adore today and we'll get to this, is actually from the Shroud of Turin. But it was the veil of Veronica, the image I just showed you, that was first used in holy face devotions. So kind of an interesting point. Now, there is a guy who has a theory, and I've read a lot on the Shroud and these different claws, and there is a guy that has a theory that I think is interesting. And his last name is Beatty, and he has a theory that that veil of Monopopello, Monopello is different than Veronica's veil. Because I told you a second ago, many people think it's the same. He says they are different and they are not connected. He says that that veil may be one of the three cloths that were found in our Lord's tomb that we just read in John chapter 20, verse 7. He said, as like I just mentioned, that it is wrapped around the outside of the shroud. And that's why it had no blood on it. Unlike the veil of Oviedo that would have been placed on before he was removed from the cross, or I should say as he was removed from the cross and taken to the tomb. So it is possible that the image of Christ was impressed on three separate claws. That's the next slide. Are these the three claws of Christ? The first one to the left, let's keep this image up there, is the Shroud of Turin. We're going to talk about that in depth here in a minute. That is the full body image of Christ. The second is what I talked about, the Sudarium of Oviedo, which we believe covered the face of Christ on the cross and being removed from the cross. And the third, the image on the right, was the one that we just said, is the veil of Manopello, and it was tied around the head of the, our Lord on the outside of the shroud. Now, in the next video, or slide, I should say, you can see where connections are made. Look at the connections, even to that cartoonish looking character on the right, and I don't mean character, I'm sorry, image. It is in many ways connected. So this is very important in understanding, why do I give you all of this? Why am I telling you all this? Because it all connects back to the shroud and an understanding of these burial cloth relics that our Lord left behind for those faithful like you and me. Now let's go back one more time to the face, the holy face of Manapello. Let's take a look at it one more time. Again, kind of an odd looking, sketchy looking image. But I wanted to show it one more time because this veil has no blood stains, no crown of thorns, and the eyes are wide open. Look at this. It's interesting. This would argue that it was made by the living face of Christ. 
while he was alive, right? Or at least not dead because the eyes are open. There's no blood. There's no crown of thorns yet. So this is interesting. Now, it is impressed on the veil while the resurrected Christ, as I said, was still shrouded. But how do we explain what looks to be like a broken nose, cartilage, and a swollen cheek? This would seem to disprove Beatty's theory that this cloth would only be the image of the resurrected Christ. But actually there's an answer. It happened at the same time. If this image was wrapped around the face of Christ, outside the shroud, theologians and scientists have said that the image may have been imprinted at the very moment when the soul of Christ, and I'm reading right from the scientific writings, informed the body, but before the body was completely glorified. That would perfectly explain what we see in this image. Fascinating. Unbelievable. So we may have three holy relics. Not just the shroud, but the veil of Oviedo, which was placed on our Lord on the cross and in going into the tomb. And then afterwards, this holy face of Manalpello, which we look at and see, is different, but all connected. Now, here's a couple interesting things. The fabric that was used in this veil of Manopello is very, very, very unique. Today, there's only one woman in the world, and I don't know if she's still alive because I didn't research this recently to see maybe she's passed, but there's only one woman in the world who produces this fabric, and her name is Chiara Vigo, and she lives in Sardinia. The fabric is called bisis or bisis, and it's a precious material that was used in ancient times. Now, why do I bring this all up? Because you cannot paint on it. It is impossible to paint on this material. And this is the material that that cloth of that faced image is made out of. You know, in fact, Padre Pio called the holy face of Manapello the greatest miracle we have. Very interesting. Only 20 hours before his death in 1968, he was, through bilocation, praying before the image of our Lord, this image, right? The face of Manapello. And he was discovered there by another priest, this Padre Domenico, who actually spoke with Padre Pio right before his death. And he said that about this image. Fascinating. So let's go to our next slide where you can see the mystical properties. Look at this. There is the veil that is see-through, but when you put your hand behind it, look what happens to the image. This is very fascinating, and that's on the other side. You can see if it was on the one side, but this is on the other side, which doesn't explain through science how you could do this. It is a miraculous image. Now, going to the next slide is why we are here today. We are here today for this, the Shroud of Turin. This is how it looks to the naked eye. On the left is the front of the image, on the right is the back of the image, but this is the same side of the cloth. I just put it this way for visual purposes. You see, as I said, the body wrapped around, or the cloth wrapped around the body, and we have to the naked eye what we see on the screen before you. 
This is the most studied artifact in human history. The image has the characteristics of a miraculous artifact. And we're going to go through those details right now. If we could put that image back up one more time, Brother Mark, I would like to show there's also on each, now remember this is the front and the back, so you have the front and the back of the shroud, or the back of the person, but all the same side of the shroud. What are those elongated lines that are on the image? Those are actually from a fire. Those are burn marks from a fire that we're gonna talk about in 1532 that scorched the image and are left on there. That's not part of the body of Christ. They were burned on there. So now let's go to the next slide and we see that same shroud, but in a different context. Here we have the shroud photographed. Notice the difference from the naked eye, which I showed you just a second ago, to now looking at a photograph of the shroud. It's much clearer. And this miracle was an example that we learned about photographing the image way back in 1898, when photography was in its infancy. And our next slide is the man who brought it to us. His name, Secundo Pia. That's a picture of him. And he was one of the early users of photography. Now, why do I show him? This is important because he in 1898, when the shroud to the naked eye wasn't real clear, took a picture of it. And this picture on the next slide is much clearer. Look at the difference in how much more defined that picture is. It's much clearer. We see our Lord's face. This is the face on the shroud. Now, why is this important? This picture is much clearer. Here's where it gets fascinating. And I want to tell you a little bit of the story. All right. Do you all remember the days when we used to take a picture? I don't know if some of you remember. Uh, probably most of you do. I certainly do. And you'd have to wait to go pick up your pictures from the Kodak store. And the Kodak store would give you a series of negatives. And the negatives were this ghosted out image of what you took a picture of. So if you took a picture of your dog, like I used to Rocky, my yellow lab, the picture that would come back would be accompanied by negatives. And the negatives were those ghosted out, like gray and, and black and ghosted out, right? Okay. So if my dog is what I take a picture of, my dog is what they call a positive. He's a real thing, a real positive entity. And you take a picture and I got back a negative from the Kodak store and that ghosted out image of the dog is called a negative. So when you take a picture of a positive, you get a negative. Now, here's what's interesting. When Secundo Pia took that picture, that picture was a positive because it's much clearer, much more defined, and it startled the scientific world. The picture he took, he didn't get a negative. When he took the picture, he got a positive. What does that mean? That means that whatever he took a picture of is a negative. Because when he got it back, he got a positive. So he takes this picture, he gets a positive. What does that mean? He took a picture of something that's a negative. What does that mean? The shroud is a negative. Now, what does that mean? That means the shroud is a picture of something. 
The shroud is a picture of something, not a painting, an actual emblazoned, burnt image. So this picture that Secundo Pio took, and I'm going to put it up again in a minute, not yet, is clearer because it is a positive, meaning the shroud was a negative, meaning it is a picture of somebody on that image. That somebody was Jesus Christ, who was a positive himself. So I know this is confusing, but let's go backwards. You have Jesus's, Jesus and his body, which is a positive. It's burned into the shroud. The shroud is a negative. Then Paul, uh, Secundo Pio takes a picture of that negative shroud, and he gets a positive. That's why it's so clear and fascinating. Now, science that has investigated this image for years has said the only thing that could create such an image would be a burst of light that scorched into the cloth that made the cloth a negative. Now, what do you think of when Jesus resurrects from the dead? Don't you think if you were there at the resurrection, you would think there would be a great burst of blinding light? I mean, even the movies we watch, right, of the resurrection, what do you think of? When Jesus resurrects, you think of this great burst of light. And that burst of light would have been needed to make such a scorched image into the shroud. Now, the science say that it's actually like this image went through the cloth because it was burnt into it. It's almost like the image went through it. And others have said the only way to do this, if it's not a great burst of light, or uh, I should say a, a, a burst of light would be a burst or bolt of radiation. That also is what I would expect at the resurrection. And some saints have talked about this. That at the resurrection, it may have been like a bolt of radiation. Either, either way, it is a picture of something. And a picture of something cannot be clearer than the item you took the picture of itself unless it is a negative. Fascinating. Let's go back to that slide of that image of Jesus on the shroud. You know, this is the only image on earth that scientists are aware of that this is the case of the image being a negative, taking a picture and getting a positive, the only one. But let's look at this. We see on this image a crown of thorns. You see different items that we're going to go into detail about the face. But look at the clarity. So we can take that image down now because we're going to come back to it. Now, what do we know about the shroud? All right. There's tons of things, and I could stay up here for hours talking to you about the shroud. But let's just recap some of it. Let's start with the first slide. What do we know about the shroud? All right. It is a linen cloth made out of flax that measures 14 feet in length and three and a half feet in width. Okay. It is a woven in a herringbone pattern. I'm going to pause on that right now and come back to it because that is very important. It contains burn marks from a fire. That's what those two edges are that look like poles. I told you before that it was a fire that happened in 1532. Let's go on to the next image or slide. It bears the image of a man who appears to have died from crucifixion. The image is that of an adult male, 5'10", in height, weighing about 175 pounds. One of the scientists said his physique was muscular and well-built. It is estimated that this person was 30 to 35 years of age. Let's go to the next slide. The image contained on the cloth is only visible on one side, as I mentioned. And the image penetrates only the top two microfibers. 
This is very important, as we'll get to in a moment. It's because paint, if this was painted on, would seep down through into the microfibers, into the fabric itself. But this has not done that. The image is only on the top, like hovering like the Our Lady of Guadalupe, all right? It's very similar that it's just on the top, like resting on the top. It's not seeped in like paint would do. And also it contains numerous blood stains, all right? Numerous blood stains. Let's go on to the next slide. The wounds and the blood stains match those suffered by Jesus of Nazareth as recorded in all four gospels. Okay, so if you see that, this covers a summary of the description of Jesus as he was crucified in all four gospels. Now here's another interesting thing. This is the only example that we know of in written history. And we've got the written history of Josephus and others from the Romans and, and um, uh, historians going way back into time before Christ into to time of the years BC where, where um, we have written documented history. But this is the only example in the scriptures that we have a written example of a man being both scourged and crucified. That is in the Gospels. The only written account in human history of an individual man being both scourged and crucified. Either the man was just scourged for a crime or, or, or infidelity, but he was not crucified because his crime didn't warrant death. So he was scourged to teach him a lesson. Or a man was crucified for a really bad crime. But those cases, the man who was crucified was never scourged. The reason is they didn't want him dying out of weakness and collapse before reaching the place to be crucified. Remember, that's why even in the Gospels, they somewhat lightened up on our Lord because as bad as he was scourged, they didn't want him to die. And that's when our Lord was falling on the passion. They got the help from Simon, right? Fifth station of the cross. And Simon helped him because they didn't want him dying before he got to his place of crucifixion. How ironic. Well, anyway, this is what we have in the history of the shroud. Now let's keep reading. The wounds, as I said, match those suffered by Jesus in all four gospels. The wounds and the blood stains found on the head match those caused by a crown of thorns. Nail wounds are found in the wrists and the feet. And I know this is an ongoing debate of the, whether Christ was nailed through the hand or in the wrist. It does not, it, this is not a, a dogmatic revela, revel, a revealed faith or a, um, element of the faith. It's, it's not dogmatic that you have to believe that he was nailed either in the hands or the wrists. You're free to believe either. It doesn't change the concept of our faith or the teaching of our faith. It's not doctrine. It's tradition with a small T. But I look at it on the shroud and I see the wounds on the wrists. So that's where I believe, and science does support that, that the body would have stayed on the cross if nailed only through the wrists. Then we see a wound in the right side of the torso. All right, so this is very, very important that we look at how that wound got there. Now let's go to the next, and we'll talk about this more, but let's go to the next slide, the characteristics of the shroud. The characteristics of the shroud are very important. All right, first of all, that is again the image that we see with the naked eye. That image is not from an artist. This image, and we can take it off the screen now, is an image that we see 
printed in materials, magazines, uh, whatnot. It's in, not done by an artist because there's no paints that make up the image. There are no dyes and there, no, there are no brush strokes, nothing. And as I mentioned, the image that is on there only penetrates the top two microfibers. It doesn't seep in. As I said, paint would seep in. Now people will say, but Father, they found paint on the image. Yes, but the paint was from past relics touching it. Relics that had paint on it in a reliquary that touched to the shroud are the paint that they found on the shroud. All right, so let's take a look now at the next slide and the image on the shroud. All right, first, look at the wounds. This image on the shroud shows blows to the face and the body, and those blows were made by tools that we see in the next slide. You see these tools? These tools, they know from the design of the wound or by analyzing the wound on the body from the shroud of what type of tool was made to make that wound. Now what's fascinating is these are the exact tools used by first century Romans. See those tools on the left hand side? Those were not tools used in different parts of the world at different times in history. These were tools used by first century Romans and the design of those tools are what made those wounds on the image on the shroud. Okay, now the wounds on the head, as we said, match the crown of thorns. But back to that image, let's put it back on the screen of the close up of the face of Jesus. They actually say that the crown that we call a crown of thorns was actually more like a helmet. It actually went around our Lord's whole head based on the wounds on the shroud. Not just a crown, but a whole entire helmet. Then let's look at this face. You can't see it real well, but the newest discovery that I think is fascinating is when they blew up the face on the shroud, they discovered in the eye sockets two coins. Now, normally coins were placed in the eye sockets of the dead because of rigor mortis. They didn't want people, after they died, the bodies reacting and the eyes opening. That just freaked everybody out. You would have a situation where everybody's gathered around a dead body and all of a sudden the dead body jerks and the eyes open up. People would run for miles. But the problem is they had to put something in those eyes to prevent those eyes from opening up. So the tradition was they would place coins in the eye sockets. Now, when they blew up the image of the face a few years ago, they discovered there were coins on those eye sockets. And those coins, they could read the inscription. Now, there was some debate that, oh, Father, it's phony because the inscription was misspelled. Well, they found other examples of other coins from that time period that were also misspelled. So it's very possible. But what they were able to read on those coins is that those coins were printed in 29 AD, so four years before our Lord's crucifixion, which I have a four-year-old quarter right now in my pocket, that were printed under the authority of Pontius Pilate that bore in Greek the inscription Tiberius Caesar. Fascinating. You know, this is something that I wish the news would broadcast around the world, but you never hear about these things. All right, let's go back to the image on the next slide. Here you can see, I mentioned the wounds of the wrist. Take a look where the arrow is. We can see the wounds on the wrist. Again, showing the blood which discolors and darkens in the image. Now let's go to the next slide. That looks like just a mess of, of um, stuff there, doesn't it? Well, actually, if you look on the left, the body of the shroud is blown up, so what you see on the right is a close-up. 
Now what you have there is blood that is actually red on the shroud, R-E-D. It's red, the color red. Well, blood remains red forever when the liver produces a chemical that comes from being tortured. If you're being tortured, your liver will produce a chemical that will then make your blood, even after you bleed and it gets onto a cloth, remain red forever, not turn black, but remain this color. And that's the color on the shroud. And the blood was on the cloth before the image was made. That makes perfect sense. They have proven scientifically that the blood on the cloth was there before the image was made. The image was scorched after the blood was already there and the blood was not smeared, which shows that he would not have been drugged out by, um, or the cloth would not have been taken off by, by tomb robbers, tomb raiders. Because if the tomb raiders would have taken the cloth off, the blood would have smeared. If Jesus was not dead and he would have struggled to get out of the shroud, the blood would have smeared. None of the blood on the shroud is smeared. Again, it looks like this image was burned in without any movement. It went through it is the only explanation that science can give. Now, remember the blood that comes in that image that we showed was from the heart. What's interesting is we have an understanding from scripture that when our Lord was speared in the side, blood and water came out. But where did it come from? It actually came from the heart. Because when Jesus was speared on the cross, the spear of the soldier went through his chest cavity, punctured his heart, and the heart was where the source of the blood and water that poured out his side came from. On that image, let's go back to it, Brother Mark, that image we see near the heart is a pooling of, guess what? Blood and water. When they tested that pool where the arrow is, it was blood and water. So this takes us to our next slide, the divine mercy image. Because here, where do we see the blood and the water coming out from? The heart of Jesus, the most sacred heart of Jesus. This is very important in the connection, and we're going to get to these connections even deeper here in a minute. All right. I think what's important to remember is this. Us as faithful, we believe the shroud is an image of Christ, and we also believe the divine mercy image is an image of Christ. Why did he leave two? Why didn't he just leave one? Either the shroud if, he, if that's an image of Christ, why do we need the image of divine mercy? Or if it's the image of divine mercy, why do we need the shroud? This is why. The connection is you have in the shroud, the crucified Christ, and in the divine mercy image, you have the resurrected Christ. The same person in two different forms but they are the same person. We're gonna show that amazing connection in just a few minutes. For now though, let's go to the next slide. In 1975, science analyzed through a NASA tool called the VP8 Image Analyzer, the face on the image of the Shroud of Turin, and let's look at this for a minute. Doesn't it look like a clay mold? It's got a 3D effect, but the shroud is a 2D image. The image, not only is the image 2D, but it's not even living, at least we think, right? Well, maybe so. But this image on the shroud is 2D. So when they analyzed it with this VP8 image analyzer, they were shocked. Science was absolutely shocked and it was the only 2D image in the world they've ever seen with 3D information. 
What that means is this 3D image that you're looking at on your screen means that a 2D cloth that the photo was taken of must have had three-dimensional information in it, which means that when it was made, it was in a 3D shape. Well, doesn't that make sense if the shroud was a 3D shape around the contour of our Lord's body? The body is 3D. If you lay an image around it, if I put a bed sheet over my face, I am going to have that image in a 3D shape. If I disappeared from underneath it and the cloth never moved, it would still be in a 3D form because it had 3D information with me under it. The cloth laid over me is capturing 3D information, although the image on the shroud is 2D. And it's fascinating because the image in 2D isn't even deformed. If I took a two, uh, if you took a picture of, of a, excuse me, if you put a cloth over my face and you molded it around my face and then burned an image of my face, when you took the cloth off and laid it flat, it would be distorted. Because as that cloth is on my face and captures the image of my face, part of the cloth is lower, part of the cloth is higher. And when you lay that cloth flat, it's going to be distorted. Well, that doesn't happen with the image. It's completely perfect, which again explains, or excuse me, can't be explained by science. It's impossible. If that image, well, Father, somebody made that image around a 3D model. They burned, they heated up a 3D model. This is one of the arguments. They heated up a 3D model of a human form. They lit it and, 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 and raised it to a high temperature and then placed the image of the, or excuse me, the cloth on that 3D model and burned it into it. If you did that, the cloth, when you laid it flat, would be distorted. Because if you had to push that image up to the, or excuse me, the cloth up to that face of that model, you'd have to push it against all of it to burn it into it. But then when you lay it flat, it wouldn't match. It would be distorted. Because the face is 3D and the cloth would be laying flat. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. All right. Now, let's go on to the next slide. Three years later, in 1978, testing was done on the shroud, and they found many interesting facts. I don't have time to go through all of those. Let's breeze through a couple of them. Next slide. The article, the particle analysis was how they conducted the testing. They did also chemical analysis, blood analysis, photo mi 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 uh, microscopy, they did spectroscopy, they did x-ray radiography, uh, re radiography, they did infrared thermography, they did x-ray fluorescence spectrometry, tree. they did photo scans from the infrared to the ultraviolet. I can't even pronounce these things, let alone they did them all to the image on the shroud. Let's go to the next one. There was no inorganic pigments. Ah, interesting. Talking about was it painted or made. There were no substances manually applied to the cloth. There were no artistic substances. No collagen binder. There was blood test positive for human aspects of human blood like hemoglobin and serum. The tested came back AB positive, which is the same blood in all Eucharistic miracles. The Eucharistic miracles all come back AB positive, which is the universal receiver, not the universal donor. The universal receiver, which means God receives everyone into his heart. And finally, the blood contained human DNA. Let's go to the next shroud uh, slide real quick. As we said, it only the image penetrates the top two microfibers. The yellowing is uniform in intensity. All right, there's no capillary action. 
None of the fibers are cemented together and no substance is found between the threads, which would be the case if there was a drawing or paint. All right, so you see some other things there regarding the outline and um, it contains no distance information. Again, talking about that 3D image. All right, now, this is important because in this image, we have a lot. Let's read the summary on your screen of the final report of 1981. For an adequate explanation for the image of the shroud, one must have an explanation which is scientifically sound from a physical, chemical, biological, and medical viewpoint. At the present, this type of solution does not appear to be obtainable by the best efforts of the members of the shroud team. There are no chemical or physical methods known which can account for the totality of the image, nor can any combination of physical, chemical, biological, or medical circumstances explain the image adequately. Let's go to the final slide on this report. Thus, the answer to the question of how the image was produced or what produced the image remains now, as it has in the past, a mystery. We can conclude for now that the shroud image is that of a real human form. Notice this is what they can conclude, right? Of a real human form of a scourged, crucified man. Which again, we have no account of a human going through both except the Gospels. The blood stains are composed of the hemoglobin and also give a positive best for test for serum albumin. The image is an ongoing mystery and until further chemical studies are made, perhaps by this group of scientists or perhaps by some scientists in the future, the problem remains unsolved. Wow. This is fascinating. Okay. This was the results of the testing that was done. And you say, well, Father, that was a long time ago. We got better methods now. Yes, and every method that has been used since the mid-2000s or early 2000s supports the shroud. Well, Father, wasn't there a test? Let's put up the next slide. Wasn't there a test back in 1988 using carbon dating that said the shroud dated back to the year 1260 to 1390? In other words, this 1988 test from ironically October 13th, right? The date of Our Lady of Fatima said that the carbon dating testing that was done determined that the shroud dated only back to the Middle Ages somewhere between 1260 and 1390. This is what it says. Well, what we gotta look at is important here. How do you answer those questions? And I've done a lot of research on this. I'm gonna share just some of it with you now. First of all, the very creator of carbon testing said that this test done on the shroud was shoddy at best. He criticized the fact that only one sample was taken at the first testing, and it was way too small. That was the first problem. Now, the other problem was they dated the carbon back to the Middle Ages. Well, what's ironic is what they have pictures and drawings of priests and clerics holding the shroud centuries before 1260. And if the human person touches the shroud, it's gonna get carbon in it from the very touch of the human finger. So the very touch of the human finger is going to put carbon into that cloth. We have many drawings of priests and bishops holding the cloth, touching it. Now, most of them were touching it on the edge, but that's where they took the shroud sample from. You know, I'm an engineer by degree, and I tell you, engineers are unique. We can be very smart and some of the stupidest people at the same time. 
These engineers could actually figure out that a cloth dated back to 1260, but they were too dumb to realize that that cloth may have come from somebody who touched it later or from a swatch that was sewed back onto the cloth after the fire of 1532. This was the other big point made about the shroud, that the testing sample that was sent was not even from the original shroud. We'll talk about that in a minute. In 2000, photos of the same sample were sent to labs who said this is rewoven. In other words, they received a sample, the one that was used to do the carbon dating testing, was a rewoven cloth. And it makes sense because after 1532, they rewove it. This is interesting. The swatch was from a part that was added back after the fire. The Jacksons, who are a family that does a lot of testing on the shroud, say that the test was also skewed from carbon monoxide. The sample had cotton, gum, dye, but the linen of the main body did not have this. A second ago, I told you there was no dye on the image of the, of the shroud. And that is true. But the swatch, the test sample they sent, had dye on it. It's not even the same. You don't want to destroy the shroud, but the only way we would know for sure is to actually cut a piece where the image is actually on it. But nobody wants to do that. So it remains an element of faith. And I think God does that by design. He does it because he wants you to have faith. All right, the head of the team in 1988 later said the sample was different from the rest of the cloth. Well, there you go. That's the answer to why the test was faulty. And since 2005, almost all scientific evidence supports the shroud and its dating back to first century Palestine. All right. Here in the next slide are some examples of things that predate that testing that shows pictures and drawings of the shroud. This is evidence of the shroud that we have before those dates. All right, back in the year 569, almost a thousand years before the carbon dating testing, Syrian hymns. There is a Syrian hymn that mentions a cloth with Jesus' likeness, not made by human hands. This was the year 569, a Syrian hymn mentions that. In 943, the Byzantine emperor negotiated with Muslims for a cloth with the Christ image of Christ on it. That alone is documented, and that goes way before the carbon dating testing. So fascinating stuff. All right, next slide. I promise to get back to the hearing bone I told you. This is a picture that also predates the carbon dating testing of a drawing that shows a cloth. In this image, we see the burial cloth of Christ. This is a drawing. And notice the hearing bone pattern. That pattern was a first century pattern that was only used on the finest linen from that time and place in history. And this drawing from centuries later depicts people honoring this cloth that has that pattern. And it's the same pattern as the Shroud of Turin. Holy mackerel. Wow. All right, let's keep going. I'm running out of time. The next slide is what we're going to prove that I think is fascinating. And this is the organic chain of evidence by Dr. Max Free that shows that this shroud can go traced back to first century Palestine. Let's look at it. What do we know? All right. This Swiss criminologist, he's also a botanist, he on the shroud identified 58 species of pollen, which comes from plants. 28 of the identified plants grow in Israel. Now, what about those others, Father? There's 30 more. Well, this, this was transported around all of the known world in the centuries after the resurrection of Christ. Of the 28 species, 
20 are known to grow in Jerusalem, and 14 of the plants grow only in the Middle East, never in Europe, which means this cloth had to have been in Jerusalem at one time or another. Of the 28 plants, 27 bloom in the springtime, the time of Passover. That even puts the time of the year for this shroud. They concluded that the shroud must have been exposed to the open air in Palestine. Fascinating. So now we already talked about the time has been proven through the coins in the eyes with the inscription of 2229 AD. The first century tools used by the Roman executioners that wounded the image on the shroud are from first century. Now the pollens put this shroud physically in Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is what's not on that slide, but some of those pollens went extinct in the first century. I should add that to that slide. Some of the flowers from where those pollens come from went extinct in the first century. So that proves that it had to be there prior to those plants going extinct. Again, fascinating. We don't hear about this. Why, my, my. All right, now, the next slide. Here's what we came for. And it's a shame I had to push it all the way to the end. But we are going to finish today with what is the connection. What is the connection between the image of divine mercy and the Shroud of Turin? And this is the bang that we want to finish with today. This is fascinating. You know, how did it come about? How did we even find out there was an image of the Shroud of Turin that matched the image on the divine mercy? Well, it was back to the year 1996 and our own father, Seraphim, who had did some work on both the divine mercy image, of course, but was familiar with the shroud. And he was at a talk and working with a group called the Life Foundation. This was back in 1996. And they had the image posted up at this particular conference of the image of divine mercy. And then next to it, or not too far down, they had posted up the image of the shroud of Turin. And somebody made the observation, Father Seraphim was part of it, made the observation of the, some similarities in the face of the divine mercy image and that in the Shroud of Turin. Well, Father Seraphim took it a one step further and he took it to be analyzed in Europe. In fact, into the Holy Land where a Jewish photographer actually took a photo of both the shroud and the divine mercy image, and he mapped out the points. So the points on the face of both images, so the distance between the eyes, the, the length of the bridge of the nose, the position of the cheekbones, uh, all this, the elements that make up the face, and he did it both on the shroud and he did it on the image of divine mercy. And they came out an exact match. How is this possible. How? St. Faustina didn't even have, never saw the image of the Shroud of Turin. And the Divine Mercy image is free-handed. That one is painted. That's not a burned-in, scorched image of a real event. That is painted. You could not freehand draw it. It's impossible, this Jewish scientist told Father Seraphim, it is impossible to draw something freehand and to get it to be an exact match of that shroud image. And that image of divine mercy is an exact match. So right now, we're gonna show you a three minute clip and we're wrapping up, stay with us. We're done, we're gonna be done within the next few minutes. But Brother Mark is gonna show the uh, movie from the clip, or a clip from the movie, Love and Mercy which you can get on our website. I'll tell you about in a minute, but it shows the amazing connection between the Shroud of Turin and the image of divine mercy. It's only three minutes. Please watch. Po raz pierwszy na tą zbieżność zwrócił uwagę ojciec Serafin Michalenko. For the first time, this similarity was noticed by Father Serafin Michalenko, who showed me the effect of comparing both images 
which was done at his request in the 1990s. The results of my anthropological studies of the two faces from both images show a complete convergence with such characteristic facial points as the middle part of the eyebrows, the base of the nose, the cheekbones, jaws, the wings of the nose, the beginning of the upper and lower lip, and chin. It's worth analyzing the same details by observing the images in three dimensions. It is a face model created by Professor Mignaro in 2002, based on the measurements of the Shroud of Turin and the veil from Oviedo. The veil of Oviedo is the object that covered the face of Jesus when the body was still hanging on the cross, and this veil remained there on the face until the body was placed on the shroud. Then the veil was removed and the body was covered with the shroud. Traces of blood on the shroud and veil give us full information of how the face of Jesus looked like. I put all three images on each other, and it turned out that the eight points determining the most characteristic features of the face perfectly matched. I also think that it is worth seeing it from a wider perspective, when we do not limit ourselves to such a fragment of the Shroud of Turin. If we put Kazimierowski's painting here, just bringing it to the proportions you can see on the Shroud of Turin. Of course, nowadays such a proportional mapping of the image from the shroud would not be a problem. It would be enough to project the image from the shroud onto the canvas and the effect would have been obtained mechanically. However, as we know, Kazimierowski did not use such a technique. His painting, therefore, was made, one could say, in an intuitive way. He only followed the instructions of Faustina, who told him how she had seen Jesus. If you wanted to apply the probability calculus, you would have to do at least a thousand face images to finally get proportions such as the ones on the shroud. This means that we cannot talk about accidental action here. Wow, I hope that you saw as much in that little three minute clip as I did for a boost to our faith and a tremendous um, example of our Lord leaving us relics of himself and, and, and evidence of his existence fascinating and in fact um, we show when we do our talks and stuff another uh, video and I'm gonna have brother Mark Hewitt right now I don't know if he can replay it but this image now on your screen shows the absolute connection when you fade in and out between the face look at the difference there look at the nose and the chin and and the eyes as they fade from the divine mercy image into the shroud of turin you can see the absolute connection there of the beautiful beauty in both these images that are an exact match as again you see the image going back and forth between the shroud then into the divine mercy then back to the shroud look at that connection absolutely miraculous the eyes the nose the chin these are things that are very powerful now as i said this is a connection that is miraculous but somebody would say to me father okay so what's the point you've proven that they're an exact match but what does that mean for me what does that do for my faith well first of all it tells you they're miraculous if they weren't miraculous you could not get two images one freehand and one a negative photograph of something to be an exact match impossible secondly it's two images of the same man but as i said earlier very important because jesus had two parts of his life and both are needed for the faith. 
from his life up to the crucifixion, and then after him and his resurrection. So we have the crucified Christ, Good Friday. We have the resurrected Christ, Easter Sunday. What you have in these two images are a representation of both. In the Shroud of Turin, we have the crucified Christ. And we need to go through our cross. He leaves us that image in the shroud of him crucified to say, I went through it. You will have to go through it too, but I am with you. I endured it. So he leaves us the image on the shroud of his crucifixion so that we can see what our Lord endured for us so that we could have eternal life. So the first image is him crucified, what he went through to save us, but it's not enough. Why did he give us the divine mercy image? Because that's the image, miraculous image of Christ resurrected. So you see, one without the other is incomplete. If you just have the image of the crucified Christ, well, then he died, but that's it. But then we need something more. We need the image of the resurrected Christ. And both, ironically, have both. So in the resurrected Christ, we have the image of divine mercy. But wait a minute. Didn't I just say both have both? Yes. The crucified Christ in the Shroud of Turin also has the resurrection because it's the resurrection and the burst of light that burned the image into the cloth. So the crucified Christ and the resurrection are there. And on the image of divine mercy, he is resurrected, but he also bears the wounds of the crucifixion. It is fascinating. So both images can stand alone, but they complement each other. This is so powerful. All right, so we're going to finish today with a quote from Pope Benedict, Emeritus Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger, that we're going to show on your screen. It's just two short slides. This is the power of the shroud, Pope Benedict said. From the face of this motto, or from the face of this man of sorrows, who carries with him the passion of man of every time, and every place. Isn't that just what I said about the shroud? Our sufferings, our difficulties, and our sins, Passio Christi, Passio Christi Omnis, from this face a solemn majesty shines, a paradoxical lordship, this face, these hands, and these feet, this side, this whole body speaks, it is itself a word we can bear in the silence. How does the shroud speak? It speaks with blood, and blood is life. What is the image of divine mercy? It is blood, and what is blood? It is life. You see the connection? The shroud is an icon, so is the divine mercy image. Written in blood, so is the divine mercy image. The blood of a man who was scourged, crowned with thorns, crucified, and whose right side was pierced. Again, the blood from that side came out of his heart, which we see on the image of divine mercy. The image impressed upon the shroud is that of a dead man, but the blood speaks of life. Every trace of blood speaks of love and life, just like the divine mercy image, as I've been saying especially that huge stain near his rib made by the blood and water that flowed copiously from a great wound inflicted by the tip of a Roman spear. But remember, as we said, ultimately it went through his chest cavity, punctured the heart, and that's where it came from. Very powerful. That blood and that water speak of life. It is like a spring that murmurs in the silence, and we can hear it. We can listen to it in the silence of Holy Saturday. Wow, very powerful. So as we finish right now, we have in our faith so many beautiful gifts, and this is one of them. The shroud and the divine mercy image is the other. We will continue to venerate these holy images and what they represent. You know what we do know? is that the image on both of them have blood, and we know that that blood, as Pope Benedict just told us, is life. We know that the shroud is not painted, it is miraculous, and we know that the image of divine mercy is painted, but it too is miraculous because it matches it perfectly. The scientists determined that the blood on the shroud is real, 
and the image seems to be some type of scorch. The pollen in it comes only from that part of the world. The coins in the eyes show that it comes from only that time period, and testing shows that it was faulty. Studies have shown that the shroud is not a painting or a forgery, but actually a living icon. And what is the divine mercy image? A living icon. Both of them are icons into eternity. So on the last shroud, slide, you'll see, throughout history, they have venerated the Shroud of Turin. We too venerate the Shroud of Turin right inside or next to the image of divine mercy. So how powerful and what a gift from our Lord is the Shroud of Turin and the image of divine mercy. And hopefully today we shed some light on the connection between the two. So God bless all of you. And if you would like to get a copy of the wonderful movie called Love and Mercy, it's a feature length movie, a docudrama that you can get on DVD, please visit our website, shopmercy.org slash Saturday. There you'll also find my DVD, which I'm continuing, this Explaining of the Faith series, where I have 13 different talks that I talk about our faith. But on that website, especially today, visit it, shopmercy.org slash Saturday, and get a copy of that DVD of that awesome video clip I just showed you of the connection between the face of Divine Mercy and the face of the Shroud of Turin. So it is with a pleasure that I wish you all a very happy Saturday. We'll see you next week at the same time, 11 a.m. You'll be able to see our schedule of the following talks coming up on our website, the Shrine of Divine Mercy.org. Shrine of Divine Mercy.org. I have listed all the topics coming up. We're going to be talking about the church scandal. We're going to be talking about the end times. We're going to be talking about how to pray. So we got a lot of good stuff coming for you in the next coming weeks. Again, continue to visit us on this same channel, our Divine Mercy official Facebook page, our webpage, the Divine Mercy.org, and on YouTube, our channel is called Divine Mercy. So with that, may Almighty God bless you and yours. And through these living icons, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, and God bless you. Hello, everyone. If you're like us in the state of Massachusetts, where our governor has extended the non-essential business closure, you're going to be at home looking for things to do. There is probably no better time ever, before or after, than right now, than to get closer to God. You see, you cannot love what you do not know. So we want to help you to love God a little bit more by knowing Him. Instead of sitting at home on your couch, watching reruns of Miami Vice like my cameraman Giuseppe. No, I don't. I, I think that we have an opportunity now more than ever to learn our faith. That is why I have produced a new video, DVD series, that can be used as small groups and parishes or right at home on your own couch, that is called Explaining the Faith. These are my 13 favorite talks I've ever done that are regarding what we need to know about Jesus, Mary, confession, communion, why would a good and loving God allow suffering, and especially a walkthrough of the entire Mass from the start to the finish and everything that you need to know about it. Tell you what, here's a quick clip. In the church, it's just not come to stand, sit, and kneel. It's to engage in this most incredible mystery. This is what it is. The church, what makes the Catholic Church, the Church of Christ is the sacraments. The sacraments are just symbols. They do something. They're actual grace. Sacraments, if you remember your definition from catechism, are efficacious signs, meaning efficacious, they do something. They're not just symbols. They're efficacious signs of God's grace, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is given to us. We have it so that Christ can enter into us and live in us. Now, if we don't receive him worthily, what happens? We lose that grace. 
So please consider, now is the time to get closer to God and we're going to show you how. As I said, this DVD series has 13 talks that you'll be able to learn more and share your faith with everyone that you love to help get yourself and them to heaven. So please visit shopmercy.org or call 1-800-462-7426 to understand our faith better than ever before and to hear it explained in a way like never before. Thank you and God bless you. My name is Father Kaz Schwalek. I am a provincial superior of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge. It gives me great honor to invite you to watch Love and Mercy Faustina movie right in your own home. This movie produced by Michael Condrat is truly inspiring. It offers insights into the life of St. Faustina, her spiritual director, and into the message of divine mercy itself. Planned viewings in theaters is not possible on account of coronavirus. Video on demand makes this inspiring film available for your enrichment on Divine Mercy Sunday and for several more weeks after. It is available on video on demand in the United States, Canada, and in more than 40 countries. It is also available on DVD. So go and check loveandmercymovie.com to see if it's available in your country. In three showings, more than 200,000 Americans have watched it in theaters. May this inspiring message of God's absolute love and mercy refresh your faith and console your heart during this difficult time. You won't go to any convent. I won't allow it! Why have you chosen us? I asked the Lord and he led me here. I will grant you a visible help. He will help you carry out my will. Jesus told me that you will be my confessor. Who told you? Jesus. Write all these words in your diary. These words you are certain Jesus told you himself. And sisters' visions. I want you to paint an image according to how you just saw me. This is amazing. And it's surprising that he chose her. What have you done to him? Paint it yourself. Can I take it to America? Of course. You have to run away. Then Kavudek has issued the warrant. Please open, sir. We are closed. No, 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 no. But, but it's really urgent. Most of the things she said have already come to pass. You cannot doubt, even if I'm not here anymore. The results of anthropometric facial measurements of the key points of the face from the shroud and the painting by Eugeniusz Kazimierowski show a perfect convergence between the image of Jesus from the Shroud of Turin and the image that was created with the participation of Saint Sister Faustina. Powtarzam dzisiaj te proste i szczere słowa siostry Faustyny, uwielbić niepojętą i niezgłębioną tajemnicę Bożego Miłosierdzia. I can't do it without you. I'll be supporting you to the very end.